will get a two minute introduction. The timekeeper will ring a bell when you have 30 seconds remaining on your time so you can wrap it up. Uh, if you go over, that timekeeper will see this to the host and you may be muted. Hopefully not. I will then ask a question and direct the first candidate to answer. We'll go alphabetically. And then the next person will be first for the following question. Candidates will have one minute to respond before I go to the next candidate for an answer. If a candidate names an opponent, that person will have 30 seconds for a rebuttal. And please submit your questions through the chat room. Um, if any candidate sent in a statement that can be read, I don't think anybody did that, Jasmine, right? No? Okay. So with that, we'll start off with the first question, which will be for George P. Steves. And the first question, which you'll all get, how are you prepared to lead the community if something like a local emergency declaration were to occur again, give us examples of a time when you were asked to leave in an emergency. Gus, it's over to you. You might have to unmute Gus. That's an interesting question. It sounds more like a job. So it sounds more like a, like a job, job question than a, than a political question. Um, first off, uh, I just want to point out we kind of skipped introductions. We did skip introductions. Thank you. <laughs> backtrack, backtrack, we completely skipped introductions. Thank you. Okay, Gus, you can start with the introductions. Okay. We've got uh, two minutes. Okay. Um, as, as she just said, I'm Gus Steves, uh, or George, which is the way it'll come up on the ballot. Um, I've been on the council for six years. Um, I got involved primarily through my background as a newspaper reporter in town and other neighboring towns. Um, so it gave me a lot of back, a lot of experience in seeing how town government works, um, seeing a variety of way towns, the ways towns do things slightly differently that I think bring to bring, I can bring that to the table, the way Southbridge does things. Um, even the fact that I'm the only incumbent who's seeking re-election at this point, I kind of have some institutional memory of things that, that are going on here in town and can bring that to the table as well over the next couple of years. Um, and I also bring some experience in living other living in other communities and other parts of the country that help me see things a little bit differently. So that so that while the community that that I live in now and I've been here for since two thousand and seven, and I love this town, it's it's not blocked off from the world with walls. So we have to reach out to the rest of the world and learn things that we can, whatever we can, to bring it bring it back to this community and help our town thrive. Um, to me, that means becoming self-sufficient to the greatest degree we can, taking care of each other, learning um, from each other, and having fun with life. Um, to do so, we need to honor our past and future, our technology and our ecology, and various cultures that make up this town. Um, I want to say thanks to the people who are organizing this um, and the people who have supported me over the years. And I just do want to clear, clearly point out that, that my fiance, Maureen, is one of the organizers. However, uh, I have not been privy to any of the questions. Um, and I made a point of not being anywhere close to any of the Zoom meetings that you guys have had to organize this. So um, like that first question that, Denise, that uh, Kathleen just threw at me was a surprise. I've never heard that one. Um, but anyway, um, and also I want to say thanks to all of those who have supported me over the last six years. Um, I'll admit I was kind of unsure whether I wanted to put in to put in my papers for this. Okay, thanks. Um, but several people said that they thought I should continue, and I appreciate that confidence in me. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll go on, and we'll come back to you, Gus, with the first question once we go through the rest of the other four candidates. Denise Clements, Denise, how are you? Um, I think maybe we should do the uncontested. Candidates first. Okay, good point. Um, okay. And I don't know. I don't know if we so, lost Denise or not. Do we so. have? Do we have Spiro, Tom, Tom over here, or we have Laurie? I think Laurie was here. Laurie's here. Yeah. Laurie, do you want to give an opening statement? Hi. 
My name is Laurie Andrews. I'm currently, I've been here three years. Um, so I've been volunteering a lot in the schools. I have six kids in the, in the system in the public schools in Southbridge. So I'm extremely motivated to want to make changes and to see changes happen. And hopefully they will happen that we can all work together in unity at some point. That's the ultimate goal everywhere in the world. But um, hopefully in Southbridge, we can get it to work a little bit better. Um, my grandchildren's education is the, of the utmost importance to me. And I do, do value, you know, information. And I'm, I don't know, I, I really don't know what to say besides I'm just a grandmother who has custody of her children and she just wants to change and, and do better. Because I know Southbridge was on the bottom for so long. There's no need for it. The, 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 the people are here. We got it. We can do it. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, right. Next is, um, I, I'm sorry, did I cut you off? Were you finished, Laurie? No, ma'am, you did not. Okay. Um, Arthur Martin. Arthur? Is Arthur, he, he was here. He has yet to unmute him. Oh. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. Hello. Hi, Arthur. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Arthur Martin, and um, I am running for Redevelopment Authority. I actually joined the Redevelopment Authority three years ago um, as a, uh, to fill an unexpired term. I, replaced, I actually replaced Dave Adams. So this time around, the Redevelopment Authority, um, the terms are five years, um, and currently we have four people there. But as a, a lifelong resident, um, I, it was my opportunity to at least get involved in a smaller scale um, in trying to, you know, help our town out in one way or the other. And um, so that's that's basically, you know, why I'm, I'm running again for redevelopment. Uh, if, if a few people are not sure what we do, um, redevelopment is it covers the area in the core district of downtown Southwich, and it was created to help revitalize uh, economic development and um, for, for basically improving the downtown area, help uh, encourage businesses to come in. And we have a few projects going on. The current one is a Central Street parking lot um, project, which was actually started before I, I, I joined. And that one's almost and, uh, coming to a uh, end. It should be finished up in in basically the fall. And things like that uh, should encourage and help businesses want to come into Southbridge and, and basically be part of our economy. Uh, so that's kind of a short idea of what the Redevelopment Authority does is to help get our economy going again and, and make it a, a better place for businesses to uh, to thrive in, um, and I, I thank you for your support. And um, and there is actually still room for one more person on that committee. Um, we can have five people, and so if there's anyone else that would like to join, just get a hold of our chair, uh, Andrew, um, and he can uh, probably explain to you how to, to get involved. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Thank now you. we'll move on. I don't think there are any more uncontested candidates here that are on the ballot at any rate. So we'll move on to uh, Denise Clements. Denise? I think she's having a hard time um, getting in. Jack? Jack, I, oh, I unmuted you so you can... You raised your hand. Let me get back. Um, I'll try to get back. Uh, let her know that uh, to try again. Okay. Yeah, if she could try again, then we'll just um, we'll move on to other candidates and then try to keep her um, for when she gets back in. Sorry. Great. Okay, then we'll go on to um, Joseph Dow. You there, Joseph? Well. Hi. How you doing? Good. So we're going to start at two minutes? You have two minutes. Okay. So uh, my name is Joseph Dow, uh, candidate for the town council. 
Uh, I came to America from Lebanon. I was 19. Uh, I landed in Southbridge. Uh, I uh, got a job in a local uh, uh, business and uh, I started working. I, uh, I created my family. Uh, I bought a house in Southbridge. I was able to uh, uh, give something small for the town, volunteer firefighter for seven years, all firefighters. And uh, and I make I you know get my own business my businesses. Uh, I don't know what happened. You know I used to hear uh, Southbridge is uh, uh, providing the ward with the eyeglasses from the AO. Uh, you know we don't hear that anymore. Uh, we are blessed. We have a few company left to remain like a uh, high tool, uh, 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 Dexter's and uh, United Lands. Uh, remaining our job to uh, inspire other company to come in in town and uh, join us uh, we have the tellers we have the space uh, we have the tool the we have a fire department we have police department water and sword we have the airport we have many things we can make it happen uh, uh, it's also a beautiful town uh, we we need to set an agenda uh, uh, for a vision for the next town manager and administration. Uh, South is, it, it could, it could, it's, it's a beautiful town, you know, like I feel like I belong here, you know, and, and, and I did anything I can to stay in the town and, and make businesses and provide the job. We need uh, to get our uh, education system right. Uh, there is, is better South of from all, from me, better South of from all of us. Uh, we can do it. Uh, I ask for uh, your vote and uh, your support uh, for the election. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Dow. Okay, now we have Jacqueline Marie Ryan. Jackie. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Ryan and I'm running for the Southbridge Town Council. I'm running because I believe Southbridge has a bright future ahead of it. If we as a community and a council pro-business pro policies make the proper investments in our infrastructure, like our roads, our schools, and our fire and police. And if we increase transparency in our local government, Southwood will be setting itself up for success in the long term. I also believe that we need to move away from the practice of just increasing taxes and move to having a properly controlled, fiscally responsible budget. People in this community have seen their taxes go up for the last five years significantly, and we need to stop that trend. I bring a unique perspective to the table when it comes to governing. I'd be the youngest person on the council being only 25 years old. However, don't let my age fool you. I've been involved in local government since I was 16 years old. And during that time, I have fought for more investments in our infrastructure, for greater fiscal discipline, for increased transparency and for promoting our business community. I moved here five years ago because I saw the potential that you can choose to have. I want to live my life in a Southbridge that is thriving. I care deeply about this community. I want to help Southbridge secure a bright future. I look forward to tonight's forum and to hearing what all the candidates have to say. Thank you and I humbly ask for your vote on June 9th. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you very much. So is Denise here now, Jasmine? So Denise, you could go yes. next. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, oh, all right. Let me unmute her. Make sure that I'm find her here. Where'd she go? Oh, there she is. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I was trying to find you in the participant box. There you go. Sorry. Okay. Uh, this is going to be tricky to get my So my phone is a lot like, I'm sorry to interrupt you. My phone is bringing you up. But not my laptop. You're live, Denise, though. I got it. I'll stop talking. Oh, no, no. Um, It's your introduction. Go ahead. Oh, you mean live. Well, hang on. I've got to yeah. now. I, I Live. Give me a no, second. No, that's okay. Yeah. I didn't know it was my turn. I haven't started the clock yet. Yeah, I think it was a little loud from when I came on. You can go ahead. Well, now I'm reversing. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, now I'm just I'm just pulling up my paper because I was reverse on how I was. Um, come on, just got to pull it up. <laughs> I was. In backwards. Uh, thank you for uh, being here, everybody tonight, and I'm glad you got the king sound. So let's see. Um, I have a statement. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for to the coordinators of this election forum. Unprecedented it may be, but for many, communication by internet technology has become the norm. I applaud the effort to keep the communication and transparency in Southbridge at the forefront of our upcoming June 9th election. I was born in Southbridge, for those of you who don't know me, and have spent the last 32 years here raising our five children with my husband, Bob. Our lives, our work, our home, our refuge has been here in Southbridge. I was fortunate enough to further my education while being a mom, graduating from our local Quinsigan Community College and then the Eisenberg School of Management, UMass. I've always been active in the community with youth activities and sports and many fundraisers. While the formal education has served me well over the years, it's really the experience that I gained serving in local government, addressing the needs of the people has been invaluable. My nine years on the Southwest Town Council and the last two years as a citizens member on the general government subcommittee has given me a broader perspective on what it means to serve the citizens of Southbridge. The commitment to attend council meetings, subcommittee meetings, and the dedication to be well prepared to represent not only the voters of this town, but all our citizens. The next fiscal year with the COVID crisis, our town will be dealing with many financial unknowns. We have faced challenges before, but not like this. As a town, we have to approach this year's budget very conservatively, anticipate shortfalls in local receipts and state aid to Southbridge. We need to work together to find revenues to keep our town running successfully and not put the additional burdens solely on the taxpayers. It will take the efforts of a unified town council, a strong and present administration, and dedicated employees. I would like to work for each of you, for this town, our town, for that goal. I'm asking for your vote Tuesday, June 9th, whether by absentee ballot, which are still available from the town clerk, or in person. Vote Clemens. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Denise, very much. Okay, our last... Um, Contestant for Councillor Lodge is Michael Segarra. Michael, for your introduction, introductory statement. Hold on, wait till she. Trying to unmute you. <laughs> you can do it this way. Do you have a second device? Maybe I can. Uh, I can't unmute either device on this. There we go. Thank you. There you go. You got it. Oh, that. there you go. Okay. Hello, go. Hello, Hello. 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 Welcome. My name is Michael A. Cigar. I'm a 40 year old proud, disabled, half Irish Puerto Rican son of Southbridge. I grew up here in town during the best of times, the late 70s, and graduated from Southbridge High School in 1998. I strive to bring back both pioneer pride and people striving for excellence. We as a town deserve no less from our elected officials. Along the way, I've had many opportunities and met many people that have groomed me for this public position. My family has been very active in politics, especially Southbridge politics, from my mother's hard work on the Parent Advisory Council to my current interest in the future of this town's growth and development by actively attending subcommittee after subcommittee. I and continue to work hard for the people of this town from my day as a young teenager, helping to form a youth center and so many, many Boy Scout projects to what I'm currently doing with groups like Opportunity in my own interest in hopefully restoring a multicultural committee, one that will take pride in who we all are as people of this great town. The work that hits closest to home and I personally care most for is the work with Opportunity. There's a group here out of the Youth Inc. building and working with St. Louis Guest House here in town with the aim to alleviate poverty and homelessness in the tri-county areas of Sturbridge, Charlton, and Southbridge. As some of you might know, just as of summer of last year, I too was homeless and affected by housing instability. Like many of you, I've grown up knowing hardships and struggles from the time in the flats in Mechanic Street, looking out and dreaming 
From my third floor window as a child, I want only the best and brightest future for this town. One that mixes the lessons of wisdom earned from yesteryear with the exciting new technologies and opportunities of today. It is with that goal in mind that I'd like to focus my efforts here in town and on our continued successes of infrastructure reform in the hopes that it will spawn a new wave of economic growth for everyone to benefit from here in town. From the small business owner to the blue collar average Joe, I'd like to make this town as attractive to one kid plus employers by offering them better roadways and waterways, something Selfridge used to be proudly known for. Outside of its can-do and ready-to-work ethic, we have in this town a workforce looking to work. We have generations of families that have served our town's interest well in the industry of manufacturing. Let us return to what has worked and served us well in the past by welcoming new businesses into the town's future. Let us focus on the greater good for all instead of the few select Hi. special interests of the elite. I have two, almost there, almost there. I have the endorsement of the Selfridge Democratic Town Committee, and with that, a couple standing uh, councillors that I have heard and stand behind my progressive vision for this town. I have worked to expand my networks beyond this town to other municipalities, to other elected officials, ranging from mayors to senators, and then in turn, shared and imparted both guidance and wisdom. I've attended countless meetings and gatherings and Zoom webinars from before the start of the new year to better be able to take upon me this awesome responsibility to right. the elected. <laughs> Thank you. Almost there, almost there. Oh, You're almost okay. in the Your time is up. Sorry. Can, you, uh, can, you, can I just please finish? I'm like literally two sentences away. That's your minute yeah, over. Yeah, you're like, you're over too. I'm sorry. I have to be fair to everyone. Go ahead, Kathleen. I'll post okay, up thank you. Um, Michael, you're going to have another chance to talk, so maybe you can finish it up and in the time that's allotted to the next for the questions. So right now we're gonna go into the questions and, and each person will, each candidate for, for town council will get the same question. And, uh, and so you'll have an opportunity to, um, to speak uh, for, just trying to find out one minute. Okay. Just so, Kathleen, okay. if I may. When yeah. you hear the ring, that's 30 seconds to go. When you hear that, it means you got 30 okay. seconds left. Okay, okay. everybody? Okay. Good. That's great. So, so, okay, we're going to start with Gus again. And Gus, I'll read the question again. You've heard it before. You'll yeah. hear it again. How are you prepared to head the community if something like a local emergency declaration were to occur again? Give us examples of time when you were asked to leave in an emergency. Okay. Um, thank you, Kathleen. That is an interesting question, very obviously relevant to the situation we're in right now. Um, I, I was obviously part of the, the emergency, de set, setting up the emergency declaration that our town just did a couple of months back, um, but I'm not personally an emergency responder. So the closest thing, or a medi medical person, so the closest thing I guess uh, I have had to, to a direct emergency response to deal with clients solving each other in my years as a psych group home worker. Um, and that simply meant, ended up meaning to restrain, sometimes needing to restrain people, sometimes needing to talk them down. Sometimes, and, and I guess in some cases that's kind of relevant to this question because of the fact that we as community leaders need to be able to encourage people and talk to them about why it's so important to do the things like social distancing and to do the masks. And even if we personally don't like them, because I think I'm kind of a pain, but I wear it because I have to. And uh, it makes sense. And it's something that we kind of need to be doing just to make sure that the most vulnerable people in our community are not hurt by this as much as possible. Um, I think that's all I need to say. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gus. Okay, so these are one minute. Um, uh, answers. Uh, okay, we'll go on to uh, Denise Clements. Denise, uh, do you want me to read that question again? It's a long one. I think. Okay, are we all set? Or... Yeah, we're all set. Shall I read it again? No, no, I, I think I'm good. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so um, first is this uh, something that's happened a number of times in this community, not just, you know, right now what we're dealing with is, is obviously, like I said, unprecedented. However, the tornado um, in, I believe it's 2011, and numerous, um, for, uh, numerous um, hurricanes and blizzards and such. I served on the council for nine years, um, vice chair for a number of years. 
And during those times, especially the Harvey tornado that blew through here, that was, it was an incredible time for Southridge. Uh, uh, granted, only a portion was affected. However, everybody felt their pain and volunteered. Um, during that time, I spent time walking with the local representatives from um, our state government and even with Deval Patrick touring the neighborhoods and trying to come up with plans to help these people. So I think in terms of crisis, um, you know, I've got a lot of good experience and a lot of um, great, uh, great uh, traits to be able to, to be able to be prepared and to help the town um, hands on, uh, not just behind a desk, not just making calls, but hands on out there with the people feeling their pain and taking care of what needs to get done. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Now we'll go on with the same question to um, Joseph Dow. Joseph, uh, do you want me to read that question again, Joseph? He's still muted. Okay. Do you want me to read that question go. again, Mr. Dow? No. Uh, you can hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I think, uh, you know, <clears throat> I have a lot of experience regarding what happened in 2011 with the tornado, you know, uh, where uh, my business is with, and I was there and all my neighbors uh, was affected and, uh, and naturally I react. I went and took them in. My place was it's, uh, still uh, better than others at that time and I was able to bring them in and, and provide uh, shelters, you know, uh, water and uh, some drinks and keep them safe to when the family come in. Uh, regarding if something happened, you know, similar to whatever, I have uh, businesses, uh, I have uh, places I can uh, donate and help and uh, work with the police department and the fire department to make everybody safe and safe. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, the next counselor, um, proposed counselor, Jacqueline Marie Ryan. Jacqueline, would you like me to read the question again? No, I got the answer to the question. Okay. Um, so I haven't uh, had to leave an emergency in my public role. However, I've had to lead, I'm a healthcare worker by nature. So it's, um, I've had to be on the floor, you know, dealing with very difficult situations, emergency situations in which I've had to step up and make sure protocols were followed make sure people's lives were safe. That's my job every single day. It's something I'm proud to do. Um, but at a public level, one of the first things I did when I was, um, when I lived in Sturbridge and was on the Tentasco School Committee, we had no special education pack in the district. And I viewed this as a, a big atrocity for the district because special needs students need a lot of representation and need a voice there so that way their uh, needs and concerns are met. Uh, so the first thing I did was I brought um, together community pe um, people who are affected. I brought community leaders, and we got that pack off the ground, and it's still functioning to this day. It's one of my proudest accomplishments um, to make sure that people who didn't have a voice in the process now have a voice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Michael Segarra. Michael, do you want me to read the question again? Uh, sure, go ahead. <laughs> okay. How are you prepared to lead the community if something like a local emergency declaration were to occur again? Give us examples of a time when you were asked to lead in an emergency. There have been many times, actually, all throughout my life. I've seen lots of adversity, and so has this town. We've seen blizzards, we've seen fires, we've seen tornadoes. We've seen pretty much everything here in the town bridge. Um, it comes down to understanding what the nature of the danger is and reacting in accordance to it and staying calm and level-headed. And that's what a real leader needs, is to be able to stay calm under fire and to be tested and to be shown that under that test that they can handle the stress and rise to call. I've been able to do that many, many times over just Boy Scouting alone with Troop 55. There are many times where we've been stuck on the side of a mountain in the middle of the snow and all things have gone wrong and everything can possibly go wrong will go wrong on the side of a mountain and we survived and i'm still here today i know uh, just like i said i brought up last year in my intro i was homeless and that's a, a no another whole level of adversity where you have to constantly think on your feet and have to 
your daily survival is based on how well you are able to communicate and bring people together in your community. Um, I've seen all walks of life. I've seen all age groups. I've seen people who uh, have been discarded and cast away. And people Michael, who don't want. Oh. I'm, I'm afraid, and, afraid, to, uh, I'm afraid uh, to tell you this again, but your time is up. But thank you. And thank everybody for answering that question. You all did a great job. We'll go on to the second question. And we'll start with Denise Clements. And Denise, um, this question is, with unemployment in Southbridge, the highest in the region, what are your ideas for a job creation in town? Good question. Good question. And that's to Denise, and she's still not. She's still muted. Yeah. Okay. On that. Um, that's a real tough question, Kathy. I mean, uh, promoting good business, promoting um, business opportunities will help provide jobs, obviously. Um, encouraging our local community college to have more hands on um, training for, for local people um, and getting the word out to what's, what's available. But it, I mean, as far as creating jobs, that really comes with economic development, which I think we are lacking here. Um, in Southbridge. There needs to be more outreach and more development here. Um, and it can be done. We have a lot to offer. Many, many good things to offer anybody who might want to move here. And I've seen many companies um, come to Southbridge and I've seen those who've been basically turned away. So I think that um, in order to have job creation, we need to have better economic development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and that same question will be asked of Joseph Dow. Mr. Dow, um, shall I read that question again? There we go. There we go. Okay, good. Yes. Okay. Uh, Would you like me to read that question again, Mr. Bit. Dow? <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, I just want to go back a little bit. When I start, okay. I say a uh, town council have to uh, make an agenda to go forward and uh, let those people, uh, they get getting paid to do their job uh, correct. And we have a lot of empty spaces we can fill and we need to, uh, uh, we need to help to open, to open for other company come in. Uh, we have uh, too many uh, commercial uh, places, too many, uh, uh, empty building. We need to market to market, uh, and we're 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 kind of like a short on marketing, and and help uh, people come into town and, and invest on our empty spaces. So I too many empty spaces. So, town council agenda. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so that um, second question will also be asked of Jacqueline Marie Ryan. Do you want me to read that again, Jack, Jackie? No, I, I got the question. Um, it's actually one of my central planks. Um, one of the things that we need to do as a community is provide more economic incentives for uh, businesses either locate, relocate here, start here, or expand here. Um, I want to continue to use TIFs as an option to continue to expand and support local businesses. Those businesses will help provide jobs. And it's something that I think is critical to making sure Southwich is a bright future. They're helping expand economic opportunity. I want to work closely with economic development to help market our businesses. I want to work closely with the manager, I should say, whoever it may be, to work with um, economic development to really really um, strengthen our community. We have too much vacant space in this community, vacant commercial space that we could be using. And we should be using every economic tool we can to entice businesses to come here, stay here, and expand here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Okay, and that question, that same question will be asked of Michael Segarra. Michael, do you want me to... Um, no, it's not necessary. Thank you. Um, I too is, is one of the focal points of my mission statement. Uh, economic growth is very important to me, and how I would do it by inviting the 1K 
employer plus into Southridge. I took on I'm away to make networks with people um, all throughout the year, actually starting at, way back in October by meeting people in and around Worcester. Um, just recently on my Let's Talk About It show, our very first guest was Bill uh, Coleman, a uh, former city uh, mayor of Worcester, uh, who has connections to Gillette and Ford and St. Gobain. And these are companies that I think that would find Southridge very, very beneficial to come in because we have the infrastructure, we just need to work on it. And if we continue to work on our infrastructure, I think we will become attractive um, to the outside business world and, and therefore provide jobs for our people here in town and change our way of life for everybody involved. Thank you very much, Michael. And um, lastly, Gus, Steve, um, Gus, do you want me to read that question again? You no, know, I've got it, thank you. Okay. Um, actually, I had two quick ideas in this, in this area. One is that I think our town would still benefit greatly from a small business incubator of some sort. Uh, maybe we could throw it into one of the town properties that we've had to take for taxes. I mean, even if it's a house, a lot of those are in downtown commercial areas and they'd be ideal for a small low, for a low rent place that somebody who's trying to get their feet wet in a business could use. Um, and the other idea is I think something that we will need going forward is to train, get training going on from some, maybe some of the old timers in town who actually know something about agriculture and start getting some jobs in an area that I think our community needs to get to be more self-sufficient. First by training people how to grow basic food and doing some of the basic things like food, like food production, like um, clothing creation, those kinds of things that we used to be able to do on our own in our community and most of the communities around us. But we have basically offshored to other countries and sometimes, you know, and sometimes in this country, but we still ship them from a thousand miles away or 2,000, or 5,000, or 10,000. And uh, that doesn't work for the long term. That's way too reliant on an unreliable system of transit that I think we have seen has broken down under the current COVID crisis. So we need to, I think if we can do both of those things, um, we can balance off the, the kind of like technology needs that are really benefiting us and reaching, helping us reach out to the world and our own self-sufficiency needs. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. Okay, the third question, and we will start with Joseph Dow. Mr. Dow, uh, crumbling infrastructure and roads are a problem in town. How would you tackle this issue as a town councilor? Yes, okay. Yes, uh, crumbling infrastructure and roads are a problem in town. How would you tackle this issue as a town councilor? Uh, st state Highway Fund uh, site plan for the DPW uh, road, uh, sidewalk, chapter 90. Uh, that's it. Simple. Okay. Hold them accountable. Thank you. They don't, they don't, you know? Okay. Simple. I don't want to cut you off. Are you? Okay. All right. Um, the same question for uh, Jacqueline Marie Ryan. Jacqueline. Thank you. Um, you want me to I, read I, that again? No, infrastructure is something that we really need to take a serious look at. It affects our everyday lives. It affects businesses. It affects commerce. Um, one thing that I really liked from our current town manager was the start of the investing of an extra hundred thousand dollars a year to be put towards roads and that's a smart step um currently with the covid crisis that might be something that we have to take a look at um just financially for the town to um pausing it for the meantime but i think it's a great starting point i think it's something we as a community can do because chapter 90 doesn't do enough everybody in every community knows chapter 90 does nothing to actually fix enough roads that are crumbling um, so that's something that I really liked from the uh, current town manager. I also think investing in other forms of infrastructure, whether that's our buildings, our educational system, is something that it needs to be a top priority. Making these investments has really good payouts in the end, and it helps everybody in the community. Okay, thank you, Jacqueline. Okay, now we'll move on to um, Michael Segarra. Um, Michael, with us, where is he? 
Want me to read that again? Uh, no, right. crumbling infrastructure and how it should be tackled. I honestly think it should be done on a need basis. It should be uh, based on how heavy the use is on the area and just a common sense approach. Working from the center of the town out, we should maintain our traffic flow and just keep a focus on the economist flow as well so we don't choke our bridging Main Street economy. Um, we have excellent people town. The, uh, the, our town engineer, Heather, is amazing at fixing these roads. Uh, we, we often hear in our town community, uh, our town council meetings about patching roads and patching and patching and patching. I, I say we, let's pick a road, let's get committed, let's fix one road at least a season, and let's go from there, from the center out, and let's focus on what needs to be done. And again, Title 90, like you said, Chapter 90 doesn't really do much. And um, Mr. San Angelo there, he's a wits at just financing and making things happen. So I think we have a really good team. And I think if we stay on plan, we'll actually start to see the economic infrastructure growth. Those two are very correlated together. And uh, it should pay off. And we should be rewarded by, you know, keeping our belts tight and uh, sticking with it. Going the course, staying the course and being selfish first. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael. Okay, um, and next, the same question for Gus Steves. Gus, do you want me to read it again? Nope, I got it. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, this is obviously okay. something that, as a council, we've been working on pretty much ever since I got on the council, and I've been a vocal advocate for rooms now. Uh, I was supporting the idea that Jackie mentioned about uh, adding the $100,000 a year. It's actually supposed to go up to 200000 this year, although, it may very well not because of the COVID-19 problems. Um, the, we get about $500,000 from the state every year, and she's right, there's not even close to enough to do anything with it we need to do. Um, well, I think what we can do to help this issue is one of two things, or both. Uh, one is that we really need to seriously think, consider a ballot question uh, for, to create a road bond that would dedicate a large sum of money to specifically to the roads. Some of the other towns in our area have done it. Oxford is one of them. Actually, that's on the ballot for this year in Oxford. Um, and uh, it's a tough sell because it's a lot of money, but it's everybody that we know of has issues with these, these roads. So that's not a, I, I hope that would be an easy sell. It may not be. Um, and the other issue is that we need a lot of citizen pressure on Congress to get Washington to fund these issues adequately. We've talked uh, over, uh, we keep hearing from Washington about the idea of fending infrastructure, and we haven't seen anything of significance from them. Um, so that would be helpful, too, if we can put pressure on our congressmen and senators. Um, and also, um, we have our infrastructure, including water and sewer. We've been kind of putting a lot of money into that in the last few years, and it's making a big difference. Um, it's, it, some people, obviously, are starting to see uh, significant hikes in their water bills. It's unfortunate. But... And I can understand that being people being upset about that, that they are expensive. But can you imagine if water and sewer system stopped working? We'd be in some serious trouble. Um, you we're going to see other things coming down Thank the pike you. in the not too distant future, Absolutely. like increasing filtration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you I'm, so done. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's hard to um, hear the bell and follow everything when you're trying to get all your words out. I understand that. Okay. So now we'll move on to uh, Denise Clements. And Denise, oh. um, you still here? And I'm um, I think that um, Jackie just asked if she could respond because her name was mentioned. How do you want to oh. handle that? Okay. I, I'm perfectly fine waiting until everyone's done, if that's the case. I just wanted to go on to this point since my name was mentioned. I think we said 30 seconds to respond when someone's name is mentioned, right? Jackie, you can respond now while it's fresh in your mind. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to say um, I, I agree completely with Gus. I think one of the things that we're going to be consistently talking about is the lack of federal funds coming to Southbridge, and it's been a consistent problem in multiple areas, um, as well as we really need to be pushing our legislators to be really reforming Chapter 90 um, in a really, really um, forward-thinking way. I've had conversations with my former um, state senator, when I lived in Sturbridge, about this, and I think it's something that it's really important and it affects a lot of communities and just communities can't afford um, right now, especially right now, to improve their roads when they really do need to be improved on. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jackie. It's just 30 seconds for that, for that answer. Um, so, okay, now we'll go on to Denise. And Denise, would you like uh, Michael's raising his hand? Making sure we're unmuted. No, I, I think I'm good, thank you. 
So, so all the points that have been made are very valid. Um, and if you've been here any length of time, everybody knows our infrastructure. Um, we are facing a million dollar, or potentially a million dollar deficit this year. Um, when you look at those numbers of what we're facing in terms of what happened with COVID, it's going to be really tough. However, I think with different mindset, has been talked about in the past, that there can be more roads done. Other communities do it. We have brought to the attention a number of times from a very reliable and um, experienced contractors have made the comment other communities are paving roads, they're going out to bid for the season, and they're able to get many more miles of roads done in a season. So I think one of the things that we should focus on is some of the other opportunities that are out there um, to get our roads done for, for the type of money that we have from our Chapter 9 funds. I'd also point out that the crack sealing program that was involved, that was started a few years back, has been really great. It definitely has helped to improve the longevity of the road. So give kudos to DPW for making sure that crack sealing program continues every year. But with lack of funds, it's going to be tough. And, and I, I travel for business all over. I was in Wellesley the other day, and their roads just as bad as ours. It's unfortunate. Government funds are needed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. Okay, and um, we'll go on to our next question, and we'll start with Jacqueline. Jacqueline, how would you increase transparency between what happens in town hall and the citizens it affects? Thank you, Kathleen. Um, this is a really important topic. Um, one, it's one I've been really focused on as a school committee member and as a school board chair. Um, transparency is key. Making sure people know what's going on in the system and giving them access to information is really important. Making sure that the people who are making these decisions have all the information available is also important. One of my biggest um, annoyances as having been on the school for the last three years was the lack of information that comes forward during budget season um, I've worked on, I've been on now three different school committees and the amount of information coming out from the school department is not to where it should be for our public uh, satisfaction. So making sure we work closely since council holds the purse strings, making sure we work closely with all the departments to make sure all the information is available to citizens and people who have to make these decisions. And I have to say overall, the town side of the process has been extremely transparent. I've always been impressed with the amount of information that comes forward from the department heads. So um, I think if we work closer and or a little tougher with the school department, we'll be able to increase that transparency going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, for the same question, Michael Segarra. All right. Transparency, I think, is something we personally do really well above and beyond in this town. We have Facebook and we have YouTube. And we do um, go through a great effort to show the process of what goes on upstairs in our town hall. I think it's time that we include what goes downstairs, too, in subcommittee meetings. All right. Uh, that being said, I think it's more of a question of now that we've got the information out to our citizenship, what... Do, what should they do with it, you know? And our focus should be, uh, especially if I get elected, it would be placing paving stones behind me to show people how to become active and be uh, and use that information to get involved in town government and to make the change that they want to see to bring about a better, brighter future for the town. Thank you very much, Michael. And we'll move on with the same question to Gus Steves. Okay, thank you, Kathleen. Um, this is something that I think I, I actually agree with Mike on the fact that we that we've done a pretty good job as far as as transparency in most of most cases. One thing that we still need to do a much better job on is outreach to our Latino community. Uh, a couple of years ago, we gave the town manager um, a goal to get town documents, agendas, minutes, and such and so forth translated. Um, there was some issue about the technicalities of translating things like the charter, but a lot of the other stuff could have been done and didn't go anywhere. Um, we needed, so if we could get a manager who actually could speak Spanish, that'd be really helpful uh, in this area. We still need to do that whether or not we get somebody like that. Um, I'd also put more material on the town website and record more of the subcommittees and other town boards that almost get no publicity. So we can, so people see how they, these elements of government run. Great. Thank you so much, Gus. Okay, and Denise, would you like to answer the same question? And I can read it again once you get unmuted. Okay, I'm all set. Thank you. 
I agree with again with a lot that's been said, but not transparency is not always is not always clear from from the inside out. Having been there as long as I was, um, and I think it's important. I think messages to the community of what's really going on need to come out more often. Subcommittee meetings are a great way for the community to participate. As the chair of general government for many years, I recorded almost every one of our meetings. Um, a lot of debate one on very healthy, very productive debate. Mm -hmm. uh, video machines are available. You can get to them all right from our cable station. You see Ms. Mr. Cosgrove there, and you can be outfitted for your meeting. I think all counselors should make the extra effort to record their meetings, get the cameras, do the recording, and they'll be uploaded by cable. It's very easy so that more people have the opportunity to see which goes on at the working meetings, the subcommittee meetings with council. And the attendance has been great. Uh, it's great to have all the counselors be there and talk about the needs of the day. But we, but we have to have more dedication by the, by the counselors to make, those, make that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Denise. So much. And we'll move on to Joseph Dow for, the, for that question. Um, and, uh, it's it's uh, now it's media, Facebook, YouTube, uh, town web page, and I will consider uh, once uh, I will consider hold uh, office hour once a month uh, meeting, and I will be available all the time. Anybody want to uh, talk? Great, thank you, thank you, thank you, Joseph. Okay, now we'll go on to our last question that I have, and uh, possibly there'll be more questions from the um, audience, um, but uh, this is the last question in front of me. So we'll start with uh, Michael Segarra. Michael, uh, what are your thoughts on the school system and how would you work with the school committee and the receiver to move the town forward? Wow, that's a heavy question. Um, and I actually have a statement prepared for this. I, I'm very new and I'm very green. My mother's been involved in educating people in Southford for almost 40 years as an ESL bilingual special ed teacher. We have seen it all. I've heard stories from her. I've heard her come home stressed out of her mind. Um, just the, the, the atmosphere in the Southford school system. And I've, I've, I've had to see it. I've had to live it. Um, there is no quick fix. Uh, there is no slap uh, patch that's gonna get this out of here in three years. Honestly, maybe 12. We have to work with what we have with um, uh, Dr. Villar. We have groups in place. I have um, a strict confidence in the people that are working the problem right now, and I'm giving them as much help as I can, even not even being on the council. I've offered up my own church to have um, meetings to come where people from the community can come in and voice their concerns and talk to the people that are making the changes that need to happen. So outside of what we're already doing, I think it's on, again, I think we stay focused and we stay on task. We have our plans and we stay to the plan. Things should get better, so. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And we'll move to Gus Steves. Gus, you want me to read that or are you good? Muted. Okay, no, I'm not, okay. Thank you, Kathleen, I, I, I get that. Um, yeah, that's something that we've been working on for an uh, entire time I've been on the council. I mean, Mr. Villar, oh, well, let me phrase the state. The state took over all this like halfway through my term. Um, and it's been an issue all along. Um, I think he is, I think the, the state has been giving us a lot of resources. And I think he's trying to do the best he can with a situation that was pretty broken to start with. Um, I am, I'll admit that I have been focused, since I don't have any kids in the system, I've been focused more on some of the other needs that the town has. Um, so that I see that this kind of situation that we have now is kind of, is, is, both, is both painful and frustrating, but I hope it's some growing pains that are going on. And I think we're going in the right direction, um, but it's going too slowly. And we can, we can fix this. I think we as a community can get more people involved in doing this. And that's the only way we can do this. Because there's way too much money going out of our district to uh, school choice and to the charter schools to, for this to be sustainable. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, we'll, we'll move on to Denise Clements. Denise, want me to read that again? Nope, I, I'm here. Thank you. Um, again, boy, another big, big, strong topic, as everyone has said. Uh, Mr. Villar is is working with what the state is, you know, mandated. I was for the state taking over. I admit that. 
Um, I felt that we had many needs. I am very disappointed in how the state conducted itself um, in the beginning um, with our first receiver, especially. Um, very criminal there. I'm going to make a statement for the record. And at this point, I have met with Dr. Vlar a number of times. I feel he's very confident, and I feel his heart and his soul and his resources are in the right direction. You know, he's doing the best he can do. Um, but I think it may be time to go back to the state again and just make sure that they're providing us everything they can for this, for this turnaround. Um, the worst thing that ever happened to any of us was the choice. When the state did that, it gained a lot of um, a lot of communities. So I think we as a council need updates from the, the school committee and from Dr. Villar on a regular basis so the public can see our interaction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dow, would you like to answer that question? And I'll be happy to repeat it. Okay. So we need, we need to approach our students and families uh, because our education and school system, they can do so much. Uh, we can uh, let ourselves, uh, uh, we, we can lend ourselves to the school. That's it. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, and um, Jacqueline, would you like to answer that question? I'm sure you would. Oh, yes, I, I have quite a strong opinion on this. Um, what's happening in Southridge Public Schools is the confluence of failures from the federal, the state, and the local level. This isn't something that just popped out, oh my God, Southridge Public Schools aren't doing well. There was 30 years in which you could track a decline in Southridge Public Schools. And unfortunately, the state has had a hard time trying to get a grasp on this situation. As was previously mentioned, the first receiver left under mysterious circumstances. And um, my biggest issue with the current receiver is, again, lack of transparency. He's one thing in a meeting, in a private meeting with him, um, trying to get a lot of this information out into the public is a lot harder, though. Um, so I think as a council, we need to be really working closely with the school committee, and I have close relationships with all the school committee members, and work closely with the receiver to help make sure we increase transparency coming from the school system. Changes need to happen. We have to work with the guy. He's here. This is the mandate we've been given. Now, we got to make sure, as a council, since we hold the purse strings, we hold people to account when it's needed, and we also praise the good that's happening within the system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Okay, so that's the end of the questions that I have. We need to save time at the end for, um, um, for people to do a closing statement, each of the five candidates. Um, but now I'll turn it over to Jasmine, and maybe she has some more questions from the audience. Yes. So, um, we have about... 20 minutes or so um, to take questions from the audience before we do closing statements. So I think um, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute the people that indicated they had questions. And then if other people have questions, um, type me a message in the chat and I'll unmute you after the question is answered and then you can ask yours. So the first question was, from Maureen. Maureen, if you want to, where'd you go? Yes. Where are you? Oh, yeah, okay. I'm going to unmute you. Since so you I sent it to you, I'm like, I don't have it. <laughs> okay, okay, here it is. Um, okay, uh, what is your stance on self sufficiency issues like animal keeping, such as hens or maybe goats? Um, in accordance with Southbridge zoning regulations. Um, also, what do you think about farm stands and farmers markets being allowed to, so people can be more sufficient, um, so that and we can have more local products? Okay. So thank you, Maureen, and uh, whoever put in that question. Um, we'll start with Gus, and um, I'm just going down the list here. Um, Gus, can you answer yeah, that question? Thank you. Um, sure, thank you. I did, and, and it, I did not. I did not know that question was coming, but it's kind of tied. This ties into what I said a little while ago about the fact that we desperately need 
to take our economy away from something that is so widespread and drawing in from thousands of miles and encourage people and teach people how to raise more food. Um, I think with the COVID-19 situation, we are seeing that um, the whole idea of victory gardens is probably a, something that needs to come back now. And right now, there I know I've talked to, talked to people downtown who have fenced in areas who could easily have chickens, but they're technically not zoned for it. And I think that that would make sense. I remember we had traveled several years ago back to Toronto and they had chickens and small backyard gardens and all kinds of stuff in the middle of the city. We're not anywhere near that big or that crowded, but there's no reason why we can't have somebody who's got you know, a quarter of an acre or something can't have five or six chickens. And that would help provide with the eggs and so forth and get people a little bit less reliant on having things being shipped in from California or South Korea or whoever or wherever. So I think it would be a good idea to help um, if possible, if possible, um, put some of the some of the regulations aside and allow some of these things to happen. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Gus. And Denise, would you like to answer that? Okay, I'm here. Um, so, interesting question about the animals. I uh, I successfully litigated with general government the farm bylaw when they came to us, and there, you know, it's a it's a um, it's a combination of being fair to all people, all residents, those who don't mind animals near them and those who prefer not to have animals. So I think we have to look at this as an entire community um, endeavor as to what the rules are. And that's why the farm bylaw came up. And I think we successfully navigated them. Um, in terms of farmers markets and such, absolutely. I have no problem. You know, I was the kid with the lemonade stand uh, trying to go so I think we should encourage and have less regulation on those types of things. I think if you think and somebody wants to buy it, we should let them. Oh, I'm not third. That was just the bell, huh? Yeah, you have. Anyway, um, and, okay, sorry, I thought it was done. It was a loud bell. Um, so I agree with uh, you know, other speakers in terms of farm stands and um, products, natural products and such coming in. It, it certainly helps many people. But, uh, you know, the animals, I, I have to say that I, I have to believe that it's um, it's a combination of doing what's right for all landowners, not just a few. A few. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Mr. Dow, Joseph? Wait for him to get unmuted. Almost. <laughs> there uh, we go. Okay. Uh, I think... Uh, I think in the past, I'm sure uh, some people, uh, you know, actually I'm one of the ones who was fighting to change the zone and from five acres to less to be able to have a chicken and animal. And uh, I'm the one got permit too for chicken. And uh, if, you, if you'd like to come see how I, I keep my children and, and I have uh, fruit trees, I have a garden, the chickens, uh, the dogs. I love animals, I love gardens and almost the idea 100%. It's good to have some rule regarding protect your neighbor if you have a small lot for smell and bugs and all that. But, but we need to work with some people, making it easy and flexible, not giving them a hard time to get a permit or, or, or making it happen. It is it is good idea to have animal in, in the garden and in the town of South Coast. It's very important. I'm with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Jacqueline. Thank you. Um, I, I want to say, first of all, I was all, I'm also on the general government subcommittee and worked towards um, passing the right to farm by law. I think it's integral. I think it's, you know, if people want to be able to have horses and goats and chickens on their property. I think that's something that they should be able to do. I think this common sense restrictions, um, you know, making sure that certain parts of town that maybe aren't properly sized for those animals, um, having those places excluded, certain parts, maybe the core, et cetera. But I, I do support it. And I worked very closely with, um, I want to thank actually Zach um, Laverne and Pamela Paquin for all their work and hard work on this issue. Um, I, it was really great to see the Agricultural Commission get so involved in pushing this. It's something I think is positive and it's going to help the community. And I love farm stands. I love, love shopping at farm stands. It's, um, I love buying healthy, you know, local grown food. It just tastes better. So, um, uh, yeah, so I 110% support farm stands. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Okay, and Michael, what are your thoughts? 
Hi, yeah, um, this actually was a topic that came up in one of the Southbridge local Facebook groups, and I got done talking with uh, Mrs. Paypoint about this. I, If you look at me, I have a thing for bacon, and I love to cook. Um, it's one of my passion projects I like to do, especially now during the quarantine when I'm home alone and got nothing better to do. And uh, we're talking about selling those baked goods and making, you know, just, you know, a little side money, whatever. Um, but honestly, I think it would be a great use of what we this is coming down the pike in phase three and our use of our green space here in town that's going to open up from like the Central Street parking lot um, project. Uh, it has many other names that we've like to call it in town. <laughs> but I think it'll help us break free from the death grip of these large big box grocers like we want. You know, and I think we should support our local farms, like the one up on Clement Road and Ed Stearns. I think this makes sense. Okay, thank you so much, Michael. And the next question will be for Denise. And do we have another question, Jasmine? Yes, so this question is from Chief Normandon. Uh, I know, and you, you, can you try to unmute yourself? There we go. There we go. Hi, good. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Jasmine for sending me along an invite for tonight's uh, session. Uh, I think it's really important to move forward to see uh, from the public safety perspective on where uh, where these new candidates or these candidates stand with uh, very important public safety issues. Uh, my question is, is you, you all probably know that I'm going to ask it. Uh, we have a 121-year-old fire station. Uh, back in 2016, it was the number one uh, replacement or major repair uh, uh, list for the town uh, government uh, buildings. Uh, infrastructure, I know, has been talked about for roads, but I think ultimately, without going any further, where is each of the candidates' stances on pushing forward with getting the new fire station built? We do have a location, and um, we've spent over 21 years, almost $100,000, just on studies for this. Thank you so much, Chief. Denise, do you have an answer for that? Okay, thank you. Hi, Chief. Nice to hear from you this evening. I had a feeling that might come up. So, I've been an advocate um, of a new fire station. It is a lot of money. I years ago, five, six years ago at least, at a meeting at Trump Fiber Optic, I addressed uh, Congressman Neal with um, the need and uh, tried to uh, figure out if they could help with uh, money the way we had gotten help with money from, for our police station. And at the time, you know, I mentioned it to the, uh, to the manager because Congressman said, have your manager get in touch with us. You know, there may be some federal money. So here we are years later, um, still a supporter. Uh, we're a supporter on the location. Regardless, um, I think you've got a good plan. I like the Central Street plan. Uh, and um, the big ticket, the big, the big question, Chief, is going to be money. Uh, we need to find another source of money. So the people of the town to, to do the, the millions that it's looking to cost, we need to find something else that will exist um, so that we can get this done because you do need a new fire station. I agree. Thank you, Denise. Thank you very much. And we'll go on to Joseph. Do you have uh, uh, thoughts about the fire station? No, you can hear me? Okay, yes. so I am, I am with the new fire station. I was called firefighter and I know uh, what they're facing inside the fire station, the old fire station. Uh, and uh, it's a good idea. One, and we can finance it, uh, some of it from the uh, ambulance we serve. Uh, we'll get the uh, income coming from the, uh, you know, the, the service of the ambulance. And also we need a good fire station to be responsible for those uh, factory, the big factory they have in town to be ready for them too. Uh, I don't know if the, you know, I'm sure they have everything up to date and code, but I don't know if the chief where we have three big and huge company in town that need to be ready if anything happened to a disaster. So thank you. Yes, I'm with the fire station. Okay, thank you so much, Jacqueline. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I want to be clear, um, I 110% support a new fire station. If something that's needed, I took a tour of the uh, current fire station. It is not in the best shape. It's clear it's too small for the vehicles. We have to special order our own vehicles to make them fit into the fire station. It, it, it's it's just not performing. It, it's from the 1950s and 60s. It's not meant for today's world. We need a new one. 
I, again, the question comes down to how is it going to be funded? And I think as a town council, I want to work closely with the leadership of the fire um, station committee to really find grants at the state and federal levels to help offset the cost because taxpayers just can't afford um, more millions and uh, millions and millions of dollars on top of their current tax bill. I, I think that that's going to be the way forward. And I would totally support it going under the ballot and having the voters have a choice um, in this matter. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Okay, um, Michael Segura. Michael, what are your thoughts? Hi guys, yeah, I'm back, I'm back again. Um, again, I support our, our local firefighters and our police, and I do believe that they need the proper equipment and the proper place to have that. Um, I've heard this new fire department um, or building described as the Taj Mahal. I, uh, I come from a very poor area of town. I was raised on a tight belt, you know what I mean? I think um, as long as they get what they need and as long as we plan ahead where what we're building now isn't going to be obsolete in 10 years and we can get something for our value and, and most bang for our buck. I think we really need to take a look at setting this up correctly and handling it right. Um, do I have the answers for that? No. Yeah. But I'm looking to find a solution. I'm willing to work with people on the council to do that. Thank you, Michael. And Gus, what are your thoughts? Okay, uh, thank you, Kathleen. Um, obviously, this is something we've been talking about at the council level for pretty much as long as I've been on and long before then. And it's been a huge issue. As uh, Chief Normandon mentioned, it's a really old station. It's still beautiful in appearance, but not viable as a modern infrastructure. Um, I want to see a couple of things. One is that maybe we can, we've had issues with getting state and federal funding, because as I mentioned earlier, they talked about infrastructure but didn't really do it. Uh, maybe I wonder if we can get private foundation money to help here. Gates and other foundations have billions and claim they want to help people. Let's make them do it. I don't know if that would be a viable source, but I don't think anybody's tried it either. And it's good got money. Let's try it. Thanks. Thank you, Gus. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. We're going to start with a new question. I think we have, um, I think the chief just wanted to say something really quick. And then we'll go on to the next person. Oh, go ahead. Chief? Yeah, I think I'm back on. Uh, thank you again, uh, Jasmine, for letting me back in. Uh, my office, uh, between my deputy and myself, are always available for questions. I urge you all to take a look at what we've already done uh, in the last four years in regards to uh, trying to find funds. Uh, Gus, you're right on board with what my thoughts are, but uh, we need some buy-in on that. But Again, my office is always open. My cell phone number is available to you if you need it. Uh, please, please call. You need to know what's going on. Great. Thank you, Chief. Okay, we'll start with the next question, which will go to Joseph. Uh, and uh, what is the question? Oh, I think Jocelyn just, I don't know if she had a question. Let me unmute you. You can. Can you try to unmute yourself? There we go. Am I unmuted? Yeah. No. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, great. Um, I want to start off by saying thank you to Jasmine for inviting me. And uh, Jasmine, you handled the Zoom bombing so nicely. Sorry that we all had to go through that. Um, it's funny because I saw that on the news and uh, apparently it's real. All right, so everyone, I work in the Telford Public Education and I'm here because I am the union president for the SEA. Um, I've been having weekly, we, weekly meetings with Dr. Villar and keeping all the people that we work with up to date on what's going on during remote learning because obviously this is new for everyone. That being said, uh, regardless of the economic crisis we're in, I'd like to have full support for whoever wins. And I invite any of you to come to the school. I'll give you a tour, any school you want. Just call me my... Phone number Jasmine has, or you can reach me at jocelyntallis.hotmail.com. But I hope to see full participation in our schools because everyone here is talking about improving the economic development of Southbridge, starting with the schools is key. Um, once our schools, if they were performing better, then we'd attract more people with a higher tax base and things could change. But 
you know, this is going to be a team effort. So thank you for being here and good luck to all of you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Do we have a question from <coughs> anyone, Jocelyn? Corey. Corey? Rousseau? I unmuted you. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, a little bit louder. Question is, my question is, um, as someone who grew up in this town and then moved away and has come back, I'm interested to see what your approach is to creating more incentives to bring more industry to the town. Thank you. And we'll start the, um, the question with Joseph. Do you have a, a, an answer for that, Joseph? Or did you hear the question? Marketing. Marketing and uh, forcing financing, you know? It's, it's, uh, it's very important. And, uh, Thank you. It's Sorry. The tips. Yes. You hear me? Yes. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jacqueline. Any thoughts? Oh, yes. Um, I, I highlighted on this earlier. Um, thank you for that wonderful question because economic, providing economic incentives, incentives for businesses is really important. Um, one of the ways, as I mentioned earlier, is through tips. Um, another way is working with our economic development and our redevelopment authority to help market and support our local businesses and help expand them. Um, this is a way, having the South government vote move towards promoting and supporting our businesses and helping them expand is the way we're going to uh, expand business in the community. We have so much empty space. And I think another key thing is, because uh, I've heard a little bit of talk about this over the last couple of years, is by sticking with a single tax rate, having a split tax rate. I lived in a community that had one, and it didn't work. They went back to having this single rate because they saw the economic disadvantages. I also think working closely um, with the Chamber of Commerce and hearing what those business leaders have to say about our community and what we can change is going to be important to providing, um, to helping grow our business community. Great. Thanks so much, Jacqueline. Michael, what are your thoughts? There we go. Um, I actually have many on this. Um, the, the split tax rate was something that we talked about many, many a time. Um, on many Thursdays, I spent at the library waiting for people to come in. I've sat with city uh, uh, councilors and made myself available. But as far as the economic growth in town, I think we should actually start to be very, very biased. I think we should promote people from Southbridge. I say, if you're from town or you, you know, graduated from Southbridge High or you live in town, I think you should be given a break, given a deal that makes you know starting a business in town easier for you. And I think we should start asking our bigger businesses, all right, our big wines to contribute a little bit more to the community than they have. I mean, we have people here that are working for less than a living wage. It makes no sense. You know, why can't we promote from within and from the bottom up and raise everybody? That's my question. Okay, thank you, Michael. And Gus, uh, what are your thoughts? Unmuted yet? Okay. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, I kind of touched on this a little while ago about, to, about the idea of using town on property for an incubator. Um, I still, still think we can do that. Uh, and I completely agree with what you just said about, about doing encouraging local creation. I think that that is ultimately where we are going to have to build our economy is on local initiative rather than trying to bring in big corporations. Um, however, I think part of it we can also do is encourage municipal use of river power, um, expanded public transit, and a very selective use of TIFs with strong job creation and retention requirements. And a four-year college. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Denise, what are your thoughts? Go. Okay. Hi. We need businesses to town. We need to be more business friendly, plain and simple. Um, the, we also need to market uh, a number of properties and our and our available. There was a list that was that been put together a number of years ago, which has been updated. What is now available? What buildings? What parcels of land and what's the zoning on those we have to be business friendly when people come into that town hall and get the running for which department to go to for what and then get 
um, they get a sour note it seems when they're just, when they're trying to come to the community and figure out what the steps are. Um, that that's a problem. So we need better. We definitely need better cooperation amongst the departments and make sure that we have a cohesive plan internally to attract and then retain new businesses that want to come here. We have the employment force. You've said it. The employment numbers are high here. There are a number of reasons for that. But for those who want to work, we can get them jobs. We just have to market this community better, community better, and make it business. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Denise. Okay, so that's the end of the questions, and I want to tell you that um, you've all done a great job, and we have time for the closing statements, and we are perfectly on time, thanks to our timer, <laughs> and to everybody else. Um, so we're going to start, because we're just going in rotation here, and the last one to answer the first question was Joseph, so we'll start with Jacqueline. Jacqueline, can you give us a closing statement? All right, thank you. Um, I just first want to thank the organizers of this forum, Jasmine, Dean, Maureen, Bob Chanernski, so many others, thank you. Thank you, Kathleen, for moderating. You've been wonderful. Um, I also want to thank all the candidates. It's not easy to put your name forward for office, and I deeply appreciate everyone who runs for office. You all want to make South Bridge a better place, and that's the drive I love about this community. I'm running for town council because I believe South Bridge's best days are ahead of it. We need key investments in education, our roads, and our police and fire department. We also must also be cognizant of the fact that we have to be fiscally responsible. If we all came together to make key choices for, that our community needs, then I know Southridge will be stronger than it is now. I again ask for your vote on Tuesday, June 9th, and thank you so very much for giving me this opportunity tonight. And thank you so much, Jacqueline, for being here and for speaking. And Michael Segarra, what is your closing statement? I've grown in this town. I've lived side by side with everyone. I'm a product of Southbridge. I bleed red and white. My heart beats with pioneer pride. I've grown up on this culture of striving for excellence, and I will not stop until Southbridge takes pride in itself again. I'm here as a reminder that tough times don't last, but tough people do. We are Southbridge strong, and I'm looking for your vote on the uh, sorry June 9th uh, uh, at the polls, if you can, please. Great. Thank you so much, Michael. Okay, and then we'll go to Gus. Um, thank you, Kathleen. And again, thank you to everybody who helped organize this. Thank you to all of you who are asking questions and are watching silently in the background there, because um, all of the people that are participating in our community are obviously why we're here. Um, so thank you very much for all of that. Um, I'm not a lifer here in town, um, but I love Southbridge and I want it to be a place that thrives. Um, and, and I like the fact that that all the people are bringing ideas out and I hope to be able to continue to bring ideas from all the various various things I kind of mentioned earlier um, back to the council again. So I would appreciate your support um, in on June 9th. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gus. Denise, what are your closing statements? Thank you. Again, thank you to all of you for doing this and for uh, getting me back on to participate. It was a bit of a real start, but I'm glad that uh, I was able to be here today. So I thank you very much. Um, you know, I came in, I came in kicking and fighting and, and you know, 12 years ago and the registry was moved to Route 20 and the governor didn't care and Ruth Caprillian didn't care. And it was that kind of drive to make sure the town of Southbridge had more. You know, I wanted to be a counselor who did did more. Didn't just sit on that at that day and, and take votes, but to actually be hands on. And I think I've proven that over the years. Between that, the community centers, the Christmas projects that we do with all the volunteers year after year, a hands on counselor who actually does the work, investigates, gets things done. That's what I want to do again. That's what I really haven't stopped doing in the last two years that I've been doing. So I I want to thank you again for having us this evening. I want to encourage everyone to get out and vote, get that absentee ballot, call the town clerk, come by, drive by on, on Tuesday. There will be lots of um, COVID-19 uh, um, 
criteria in place, so we'll be all set with the social distancing. Get out and vote June 9th here at the Community Center in Southbridge. Vote for your town. Vote for your future. Let me be part of that. Let me show you what I can give you again. And thank you for having me this evening. Vote June 9th right here in Southbridge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. And last but not least, Joseph Dow. Joe. Okay, uh, I want to thank for uh, your time and attention tonight. It's a clear there is better Southbridge for all of us. And I ask for the support. Uh, I look forward to work with everyone uh, towards Southbridge uh, bright early day. Thank you very much and have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much. And I just want to say before I turn this over to Jasmine, um, I have thoroughly enjoyed being part of this forum. It's, um, I have, Southbridge has a very soft spot in my heart for many reasons. And uh, you guys are great and you get great spirit and uh, this has been wonderful. So thank you all for putting your names, and putting yourself out there. Jasmine. So I also want to thank everyone. Um, this is like such a new experience um, for all of us. And um, I think all of the candidates, because it is very, very difficult to you know, run for office and do all of the things that you you all are doing. Um, and I applaud you for caring so much about our community. Um, Selfridge is near and dear to me um, as well. And, um, and I was impressed with everyone's um, preparedness for this event. And I thank you all for being here. Um, Kathleen, thank you so much moderating that was great <laughs> um and all the questions and everyone participating and everyone in our timekeeper um who kept us on task um so yeah. <laughs> no right no not, not yet not yet um but i appreciate everyone's participation and your patience with all of the the craziness that happened at the beginning um we are all learning um, social media platforms, and now I know how to set up a waiting room so we can keep uninvited guests out. So um, I appreciate that. But uh, <laughs> nothing that I didn't see in sex ed class when I taught at the high school. So. <laughs> but thank you all, and I appreciate everyone. This is recorded, so we can certainly share it out to other people. And it did start recording. I started recording after we got the the kinks out so none of that will be on record <laughs> thanks everyone for your time uh, we are actually a little bit early which is awesome so i appreciate we had like 30 guests at one point so this is well um attended i appreciate you all, all your help and all of your time thank you